David Howard's Art Scene. Christo, The Umbrella Project. They're wonderful. We traveled 100 miles to see them. Wonderful. Fabulous. They're great. They're very impressive. I'm flabbergasted. World, look out. This is the umbrella project for Japan and the United States. It is Christo's most ambitious art project to date, consisting of 1,340 umbrellas in Japan and 1,760 umbrellas in the United States, totaling 3,100 umbrellas. Metaphorically described by Christo as a symphony in two parts, this is the only artwork to be experienced in two countries simultaneously. Each umbrella is almost 20 feet tall and resembles the height of a two-story house. There were conflicting reports on the cost of the umbrella project. The figures, 17, 23 and 26 million dollars were stated by the media and Christo. We could never determine the actual cost. However, the umbrellas were only set up on view for the relatively short time of approximately three weeks and then dismantled and the materials recycled. It is difficult to see the umbrella as being art, but it is indeed art. It is just a different kind of art than we're used to seeing. But let's start from the beginning of the project. This is the headquarters for the umbrella project in Lebec, California. It houses the staff and contractors who organize and set up the umbrellas. They follow maps created by Christo of the area which indicates where the umbrellas will be placed. The Tejon Ranch, one of the largest landowners in California, provided the headquarters and much of the land for the project. A lot of the umbrellas were carried by trucks or helicopters to the exact site where they would be erected. These people are going to have to carry those. Okay. But that'll look good because it's right off of the back. They'll be carrying them. All right, so we'll need somebody walking that tonight. Yeah. There be right. well, some, all the guard had to be in here. That's all. They have to be in there walking means? that row. Which is fine. That'll work great. You'll be inside the gate, right. locked up, okay. and inside there. So they'll be dispersed there, and that way the road comes all the way up through here, mm -hmm. comes clear to the end. So this, this is a good visual, <laughs> they'll, and they'll, they'll see the stack, okay, yeah. and they'll have to carry those. Right. Right. Now those are all flown? Those are all flown. Right. Those are all flown, and, and that gets us back to this area over here that we cannot carry. They have got irrigation ditches cut through mm -hmm. on top of those things, the deep irrigation yeah, ditches through here, okay. so we can't carry those. These inventory yet? No, those are not inventory yet. This but is, those are those, those are, are flown in. Okay. Somebody near the river, and with huge crane, they put them in the water, and they have people working in the water. Up to here, up to here. And this and is Christo talking to his workforce at the yard where the umbrellas are stored. At this point, only 37 of the 3,100 umbrellas had been erected. There had been rains and typhoons in Japan, making it very difficult to erect any of the umbrellas. However, they were able to assemble 18 of them. Only 3,063 umbrellas were left to set up. In the meantime, the remaining umbrellas were stored horizontally like this and protected with plastic covers. Special carts had been created to move several of the umbrellas at one time. Handles were attached at several locations along the plastic cover to help facilitate their erection. The meeting of the workers reminded me of an adolescent ballroom brawl with a touch of humor. Here's the lion. Okay. Oh, you got a charger? Yeah, you got some tickets? Next time you got a six o'clock. Six. Yo. 
After more than five years of preparation and planning for the umbrellas, finally, all the umbrellas were put into place in both countries, but they were not opened. Christo wanted to be present in both countries the same morning the umbrellas were opened in Japan and America. However, there was a delay. Because the typhoon and rainstorms in Japan made it impossible to open the umbrellas, the umbrella opening was postponed for one day until the storm subsided. Lift with your legs. Bend down a little bit with your leg. Don't try to lift with your back. On, on the count of three, I want you to pick it up. These are the workers who volunteered to help set the umbrella project up. Christo always has a group of volunteers participate on his project. When the umbrellas were finally opened, it was done at dawn. Each umbrella took about a minute to open after the outer covering was removed. Utilizing a rotating crank, each umbrella had to be individually attended to in order for it to fully blossom. Eventually, the landscape took on the characteristics of the project, and what was previously barren and an interstate freeway now became a work of art. I was interested in finding out how the umbrellas were attached to the ground, so Vince Davenport, the director of field operations, explained. You were asking a question about the type of anchors that we use to secure the bases to the ground with. This is called a chance anchor. This particular anchor right here happens to be a, a chance double six anchor. They're four feet long. We take this anchor, a position over a, a designated area, take a, a tool that we have and we start screwing this thing into the ground. It screws all the way into the ground a full four feet so there's nothing left but this four inches of nut of, of threaded bolts exposed and this is where we bolt one corner of the base down. This takes four of these per base. This is this one would be used where it was very soft ground and, and was easy to, easier than normal to get into. This one happens to be a double four. This is where we where it's very hard soil. We put this into the rock. Uh, we have about four different ways to attach this, either by hand or with a with a, um, a generator and a, and a ratchet. Um, and we have a little machine called a little beaver. It's a hydraulic machine that we. It's a small one that we can pull around by hand and and put these to help us screw these in the ground because the ground is very hard at some time. And when it was impossible, when it became impossible to put any four of these type in the ground, we have an anchor called a duckbill. And the duckbill was a, driven into the ground with a small hydraulic, uh, with a small pneumatic jackhammer. This weighs about 40 pounds, and we can carry it around. It has a long bar on it that's inside this, and we jackhammer this all the way in the ground, a full four feet. There's a cable that goes through this. And as you, after this goes into the ground, and you pull up on the cable, it makes this anchor turn like this, so it pulls forces against the ground. And we test these to about 15, 1600 pounds. The two, the way the two cables come up, attached to the base in a similar manner. If we couldn't get that one, if that was too big, 
This is the absolute hardest ground we could get. This little small one would go into solid rock. We have to drill a hole first. The cable goes through here. We drill it down about four feet, twist it, pull it, Let's get the same test on it. 1,500 pounds is our pull. We have a dynamometer during the test. So we test every anchor we put in the ground. So we have 1,760 times four, and that's how many times we've tested anchors throughout these mountains. Even though the entire project was tested for stability more than 12,000 times, some of the umbrellas were dislodged from their bases in high winds, causing tragedy to strike. I thought it was a messed up deal. This guy's spending $26 million. You know, this guy's got to be crazy. But it's his money. He can do with what he wants. And once you actually come out here and see it, it's a beautiful thing to see. It's, it's, it's fantastic. You've got to come here to see it and appreciate the beauty of it all. It has a really good feel to it. And I notice all you have to do is see how the people react to it. I know as a monitor, right now I'm a monitor, and that's called phase three of, of Christo's uh, project and uh, my uh, position is to talk with the public but I've noticed that everyone is in a real good mood it's a like a big smile and that's what I think of the umbrellas not only do they make you smile they make you want to laugh especially when you're driving down the freeway and see how many there are my opinion is that it's uh, a waste of money in some se sense of the word but as long as it gives people something to cheer them up in this time of the recession why we can be happy about that and I understand it was volunteer labor, so that part was not costly. But I think it's a fantastic thing. I just noticed a book about him and other projects, and they are also fantastic. I think it's really that kind of happening that excites people in all walks of life and brings art down to the level of everyone and brings everyone up to the level of art. I've been here for three and a half weeks and I helped put them up. I had nothing, no, no way of anticipating what it was going to be like until the day that we started uh, opening him up and I was fortunate enough to be on top of a mountain and watching each one of them being blossomed and it was uh, just a thrill that you couldn't uh, express in any way. The day the umbrellas were opened in Japan, Christo rushed to Tokyo's Naita Airport, crossed the international date line, arriving in California five hours before he left Tokyo so all the umbrellas could be opened the same morning. This is Ibaraki Prefixer, a rural farming area in Japan. The farmers leased their paddies and fields to Christo for his project. The color blue was selected for the umbrellas in Japan because it is a damp, lush valley. I place each umbrella myself, and I like to go to see them, how they look. It's like my children. The color yellow was selected for the umbrellas in the United States because the area is dry and parched. Once the umbrellas are taken down, the blue nylon will be given to the people for use around their farms. It took a lot of persuasion, but 452 landowners in this inland valley agreed to let the project temporarily be installed on their property. Mostly growing rice and grapes, the rural farmers here have a very difficult time understanding the significance of the project. However, the art event is embraced and admired. We still don't understand the meaning of the project, but I guess those artists have a different way of thinking. Young people might understand, but older people like us, we don't understand. <laughs> the purpose is to let people know that we have grapes like these. It was business as usual. The farmers continued their work as if nothing was any different. The umbrellas simply became a backdrop for their everyday labor. Don't we have these? These are, these are all dropped already, right? Probably. No, these aren't dropped already. Oh, those are, no, those are but they're up there. We don't believe them all the top. Uh -huh. If they do, it, you know, like it's right in West Coast. I thought you only had 10 left up there on the top. Oh, I do. Well, see, that would be, for instance, that's something right here. counting those? Yeah, see, I, 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 when, I, when I do a hand deliver, I go ahead and put it on the sheet so I know right. how many I've got to get there, even though they're not flung. So actually, yeah. have, we got 43 up there, then it's just 30. Where's the parking area? Stop. We've got 43 up there instead of 30. Maybe all I have to do is just not take the helicopter back there, but just keep on going. Instead of the road 
capricious yeah. placement that he has here in California. Let's just fly him oh, yeah. and do them all. Just yeah, just fly whatever you got and and uh, fly whatever you, whatever we got to finish that, and then we'll, we'll bring up. We have made. If we want to balance it out, okay. as you see, if we're flying, if we need if we need another convoy of uh, traders up there, we can bring him up and he can finish the whole thing out. After we get okay. after we find out what after we find out what we need is we're going down. This all seems so detached from Christo's everyday existence in New York City. Behind this door is the studio where Christo works in Lower Manhattan. This is where all his projects are developed and conceived. The interior consists of only the essentials he needs to execute his art, and it seems difficult to believe, but it is true. This artist spent $26 million on one of his artworks. However, he lives and works under the most adverse conditions. The studio consists of only the mock-ups and plans for Christo's actual projects. The windows are covered with vinyl for insulation because the window frames are frail. The walls and floors are cracked and peeling, and it does not look as if they've been painted since the 30s. The furniture is made up of crates and sawhorses with plywood across them for tables and chairs. The only lighting used is fluorescent fixtures. On this visit to Christos Manhattan studio, he was kind enough to explain to me how the umbrella project was to be executed and the significance of the colors blue and yellow used in the umbrellas of Japan and America. We have the blue umbrella and the wet landscape in Japan, and we have a yellow umbrella and the dry landscape in California. California is burned by the sun, we have this dry golden grass, brown grass, and the dry landscape we have golden yellow colors. When it's Japan during the summer is the rainy rainy. By the end of October, we have very lush foliage of the forest, the deep green of pine tree, the lime tree, and the bamboo forest. We have a wet landscape, and the wet landscape we have a blue umbrella. Wet, blue, dry, yellow. It sounds simple, but it is not. Let's go back to some of Christo's earlier projects to help us understand more fully his art form. This is Valley Curtain, a monumental art piece, 1,250 feet wide and 360 feet high, Rifle, Colorado in 1972. 1985, Pont Neuf wrapped, a bridge in Paris, France wrapped in nylon. The art became part of the environment, which is not the usual domain of art. Christo borrowed the bridge to create his artwork, and as a result, this concept created the next phase or evolutionary step for art. This is Surrounded Islands, set in Biscayne Bay, Florida in 1983, consisting of 11 islands and 6 million square feet of polypropylene fabric. Once again, Christo has borrowed a setting which art does not usually inhabit creating an environmental spectacle which extends the boundaries of what is acceptable in art by presenting us with a completely original and unique situation in which to view his art. 1969, Rap Coast, Little Bay, Australia, 1 million square feet of material. This early project helped to establish Christo's reputation. 1976, Running Fence, Sonoma and Marin Counties, California, 24 miles long by 18 feet high. Once again, Christo borrowed the environment to execute his artwork. All these projects, they are designed or they are built or they are realized to broader, to challenge and question our notion about art. And there are many, many facets in that project. You know, they first, sometimes they look like painting. They, Taking the case of Surrounded Island Miami, floating pink fabric look like giant, giant stretch canvas. Sometimes look like a sculpture, taking the Pont Neuf and Paris wrap. But the Pont Neuf and Paris was also looking like architecture. And sometimes they look like a, sometimes they look like urban planning. The point is that the project borrow, borrow dimension and quality who usually work of art do not have. And, and of course the financement of the project or the temporary character of the project is all part of aesthetical decision. The temporary character of the project challenged the immortality of art. 
They have very strong self-effacement dimension of my project or missing dimension that will be miss who ca carry huge energy of urgency to be seen because will be missed after two, three weeks. And by they are also challenging our naivety and arrogance that we are immortal. The artist creating things and stones, steel, gold and material that we believe they remain or we naively believe they may re remain or we really believe that they stay forever. And of course, they have much a great, greater courage to have that self-effacement than to stay. And of course, they have a very profound bottom line of that temporary culture of the project involving the, the freedom. The possession is the enemy of freedom. This is why this project cannot be bought, cannot be purchased, cannot be controlled, cannot be uh, uh, canned, because all that will be total against the essence of the project, that project is essentially about freedom, that even myself cannot possess. The economic part also of the project ch challenges the entire issue of our materialistic society when we're existing, only moralizing our existence and justifying our existence by making money for our children, or for our heirs, by making some kind of justification, justification our presence. The project challenged the entire materialistic or capitalist idea that the money is absolutely with no importance. The money is a lot of money, $26 million, but they are so poetically free that they have no justified, no anything. Our capitalist society spend much more money on making movie or building skyscraper, but always with mind that they will make that money, will make more that they invested. But there no money can come back from these 26 million dollars who completely put offset of balance entire notion we have of our existence. And the very end, this project deal with probably one of the most missing element of late 20th century culture, the uniqueness or exclusivity, not an elitist sense, a country uniqueness and once in lifetime. We are surrounded and a world of repetitious things, blockbuster exhibitions, Olympic Games, World Fair, World Disney around the world, all that bombards our uh, reality and uh, is repetitious all the time. This project exists only once. There was the once running fence and never again. There was the once around the town and never again. There was the once wrapping upon the, in Paris. There will be no other bridge to be wrapped. And of course, there will be never again umbrellas. Of course, that uniqueness carry, and everybody knows that, that this umbrella will be not sold, that there will be recycled, there will be no umbrella for souvenirs, that the project will be that crystal, poetical freedom is translated in the mind of everybody. The work of art borrow space who usually do not belong to art. I am borrowing space who never really was considered to be the part of the art experience. For the umbrella project, we borrow street, roads, tree, mountains, bridges, houses, a river. We borrow man-made man -man -made mutation of the space, very complex designing of highway, road, system of, of movement of people. All that is intricately woven in the entire structure of the perception of the work of art. Because all that created Art who is basically very dynamic and very uh, uh, participatory. It's not, a ma it's not an art of uh, so called, uh, clinical contemplation. <laughs> you know, to, to experience my project, you need to put yourself, accepting that you should be disturbed. Basically, that you should put yourself to make some effort to move, to travel, to rent a car, to drive, to go out of the car, to walk in the umbrella, drive to the airport, change planes, take a plane, to fly, go to the country, you cannot understand the language, go through the troubles, go to the sides. All these parties put you an act action that you need to activate yourself. Of course, this is how this project works. They are very, very energizing and put you on a completely different level of uh, relation to the physicality of the things. Everything of the world belongs to somebody. 
there are no any square meters in the world that we are not controlled how to move. The moment we walk out of that street, somebody designed the sidewalk, somebody designed the street, somebody designed the highway, the, even the airway. 24 hours around the clock, we are funneled to the particular precise place, space. That space is designed by politicians, urban planners, powerful structure, and of course, we're taking that space completely grounded and we're existing 24 hours around the day by absor absorb accepting that space or that reality. And I come to that reality and I create gentle disturbance here by doing this work of art. They are probably the most essential part of the existence because they're, they're almost like a, a, a scream of freedom in a way that because they all belong to me, they're mine, I invent them, I pay for them, they belong to me, they cannot be sell, and I, I own them. You know, this is something extremely important to understand. This is so, uh, so important, essential part of art experience. Is uh, that freedom to have no clients, that freedom to be on self and to blame yourself all the time for all the problems. <laughs> The project is revealed to us, to me, I hope you understand, it's like a revelation. There's no way that I know how the project will be in, left in the mind of the people. Today, six years after the starting of the project, I can say, many, can say you many things about the project, but it would be a lie to tell you that in 1985 I know that. And the way that the project is revealed is bigger than my imagination and the project absorbed all kind of interpretation. I cannot possibly be Japanese, you know, I will never can pretend to be Japanese to see how the project will be in the mind of the Japanese people. Even that I am an American citizen, I cannot possibly be put my, my <laughs> under my skin the California temperament or California mentality to see how the Californians will see the project. You know, the project is like an open dimension absorbing that tremendous in, interpre, interpretations and every interpretation is legitimate because the project built his own reality. It's like a fabulous monster who grow, he grow like a child and he have his own way of uh, development who we hope we do the right things. No, we hire professionals, we have hire lawyers, the engineers, the specialists. We got a great amount of uh, uh, thinking that we know how the project should be done. But in the very end, each project has his own life, his own reality. What is the exciting part of this project is that they're bigger than my imagination. Anything one I can imagine never can really be compared with the tremendous <laughs> complexity and reality of the real things. Any great masterpiece is greater than each individual part which makes it a magnificent totality. Any great artwork eventually becomes more important to the artist than even his own life. This project was bigger than life. Unfortunately, two fatalities occurred. One, when a California umbrella was blown from its base, a woman was pinned against a boulder. And, in Japan, a construction worker working with Christo was inadvertently electrocuted when removing an umbrella. This documentary is dedicated to these two individuals who lost their lives unexpectedly in the creation of this great masterpiece. Additional credits, Jean-Claude Christo, Wolfgang Vols, Harry Schunk, CNN News Network, Vince Davenport, Director of Field Operations, Bruce Maxwell, Field Superintendent, Tom Golden, Project Director, 
Sarah Shockley, On Location Audio, Jim Ingram, On Location Field Crew, and Ron and Phyllis Fry, On Location Accommodations. This episode copyrighted David Howard and Christo. Howard's Art Scene.